Welcome everyone to CSIS and thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm Jennifer Cook, I direct the Africa program here at CSIS, but I want to thank uh, my colleague Dan Rundy, who's director of the Project on Prosperity and Development, uh, for organizing and hosting this event um, on development challenges and opportunities in the Sahel. I want to say uh, thanks also to our distinguished panel, particularly to Santiago Martinez Caro, who has come all the way from the Canary Islands, um, where he works as general director of Casa Africa, uh, which is a Spanish government kind of think tank, public uh, diplomacy institute, in working on Spanish um, African relations and in deepening engagement. I also want to say thanks to um, Vivian Lowry Derrick, who's president and CEO of the Bridges Institute, former assistant administrator for Africa at the U.S. Agency for International Development, uh, was at the elections uh, this summer in Mali as an observer, um, and to Ambassador Bill Garvelink, who is many things. <laughs> <laughs> He's senior advisor um, to the Project on Prosperity Development, former ambassador um, to the Democratic Republic of Congo, and had a long career on um, humanitarian and disaster relief um, uh, with USAID. And finally, to journalist and author and screenwriter Donovan Webster, who's been engaged in the Sahel and the Sahara on a variety of topics um, over the years uh, and has spent a good deal of time on the ground there recently. So we're here today to look at the development challenges of the Sahel region, uh, which are multiple and complex, and to hear from our panelists uh, what they see as the priorities in addressing these challenges and how best regional, bilateral, uh, and international uh, actors can assist in resolving them over time. Dan's asked me to say just a few brief framing remarks, um, and then I'll turn to him and to the panel. Um, the Sahel is obviously a vast region in geographic terms. It stretches from um, the Senegal on the west coast of Africa to Somalia in the Horn. For the purpose of this event, I think we're going to focus really on the core states of the Sahel, uh, Mali, Niger, and Mauritania, to some extent Chad. Although, as we assess the challenges of each of these countries and, the, and collectively, we also have to look at the broader region, both to the north in the Maghreb and the broader West African region. Uh, amid all the talk uh, recently of, of the Africa rising narrative, I think the Sahel stands out um, as a conspicuous exception. Um, for their enduring fragility and the development and human humanitarian challenges uh, that they're going to face if left unchecked and that are going to endure well into the future and, as I say, if left unchecked will likely worsen over time. Uh, these states each have their own unique political, economic, and, and social characteristics, but they all share a common set of, of challenges um, that contribute to their uh, basic fragility. These challenges are all interconnected uh, and self-reinforcing in many ways, and they create in the Sahel, I, I think, a perfect storm of humanitarian need, underdevelopment, ecological crisis, and uh, weak governance, and insecurity, and crime. Uh, these countries are landlocked. Recurrent droughts and the impact of desertification and climate change uh, have undermined the viability of what are largely primarily, uh, largely agricultural based economies. Economic fragility and weak governance have created instability as, as marginalized groups, including semi nomadic uh, groups in the north. Um, and, and fractious political elites within, within, within the capitals kind of compete over what is very, actually a very small national pie. Uh, with weak and at times corrupt governments delivering little in the way of security, services, or economic opportunity, you've had criminal networks uh, largely uh, based on smuggling, on uh, narcotics trafficking, and a growing uh, kidnapping industry. <coughs> Uh, as the most lucrative kind of livelihood um, in, in much of the poorer regions of the north. And these then have helped fuel uh, insurgency uh, and the rise and expansion of violent extremist groups, including Ansardine, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, and um, Mujao, the movement for unity and jihad in West Africa. 
and then these these groups and insecurity in turn creates disaster and humanitarian crisis, which then reinforces the cycle going forward. The crisis uh, in Mali has generated the big headlines in the last year, the collapse of the state in Libya precipitating, I think we're all familiar with that story, uh, elections in Mali and a French intervention uh, in the past year have kind of put us on a little, stabilized the situation somewhat, but the big challenges still lie ahead. Um, we mentioned in the title of this um, opportunity, I think the big opportunity is the awareness that the Mali crisis has given us that, of how these v various development channels, challenges combine to create insecurity that is really of international import. And the big challenge is keeping that sense of urgency around this, even as the immediate crisis has decided to look forward into the future and prevent conflicts uh, going forward. I have a bit more, but I think I'll stop because I want to leave it to our panel to explore these, and I've talked too long already. So uh, welcome again, and Dan, uh, looking forward to this discussion, and welcome to our panelists once again. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Thanks for your partnership on this. I want to thank you for, uh, for those framing remarks, and I'm very much looking forward to the panel. Let me make a couple of, of comments to, to kind of tee up this conversation. When I think about the Sahel, I think of this as sort of the, the perfect 3D challenge. This is a, this is a defense slash security challenge. This is a diplomatic foreign policy challenge, and this is certainly a development challenge. When Hollande, the uh, president of France, uh, went, to, um, went to Bamako after the military action uh, earlier this year, he brought his foreign minister. He brought his defense minister and he brought his development minister with him. I think that speaks volumes about how the French were, were thinking about this and how we ought to be thinking about this. Um, obviously, the Sahel is a very complicated region, has many development challenges, challenges of governance, challenges of food security, uh, water scarcity, uh, certain sorts of uh, health challenges, nutrition challenges, that, and, uh, and food security challenges that um, that, off, that uh, exacerbate many of the other uh, issues that are on the table in the Sahel. Uh, add to that the challenges and the collapse of what happened in Libya, and you've got a really nasty cocktail. Uh, but I do think, uh, what I think is also very interesting is the, that if we had had this conversation in September or October of 2012, this was not on the radar screen for the United States. Um, I will just uh, reference and remind everybody that Mitt Romney, during the second debate, raised the issue of saying Mali has been taken over by the northern, in the northern part of Mali by al-Qaeda-type individuals. A variety of uh, very clever people uh, made fun of uh, Mitt Romney, including Bill Meyer on HBO, uh, The New Yorker, uh, the Francis Le Monde, uh, New York Times editorial, and, and The Guardian all said he was an idiot for saying that. I think Mitt Romney was right, and I think people have uh, come around to realizing that that's the case. So I do think that this was not on the radar screen 18 months ago, and I think that uh, we're in a very different place, and the fact that, that all these folk, all of you have shown up on a, on a Wednesday afternoon before uh, for the holidays, I think speaks to the fact that this is relevant and important and isn't going to go away. Um, so I do think that um, we've got a series of development, uh, def defense, and foreign policy challenges in the region. I think we have an excellent panel to unpack these issues. I'm going to give the floor uh, first to uh, my friend, Ambassador Santiago Martinez Caro, to talk to paint a, an additional level of, of detail uh, from a European perspective. Uh, Ambassador Martinez Caro, as, as uh, Jen, my colleague Jennifer points out, uh, is somebody who runs Casa Africa, which is sort of a Spanish public sector think tank focused on Africa. He was ambassador in Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, and has traveled to 50 of the 54 sub-Saharan African countries. So I think he's really an excellent European partner to, to have this conversation about the cell hell with us. So I'm going to turn the floor over first to uh, Ambassador Martinez Caro. Ambassador. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, the, first, um, the first thing I would like to say is that I, I, I don't really know what I'm going to tell you this afternoon. Um, the reason being that um, I, I listened to podcasts and I was told that this was a beautiful machine. And for the first time, I, this is what I'm traveling with. And since Dan doesn't want me to give a presentation, um, I started writing. I've got some 3,000 words written here because I, 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 
I, I don't know in what order I wrote them. I can't move them around. I can't see the document. I can't The, the, the print joys it. of technology. So, uh, I mean, this is basically for work, for doing this is basically useless. Next uh, time, bring a laptop. I, I, I'll, I'll bring a laptop. Um, um, it, it, it's fine yeah. for watching NFL Pass. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Amazon Prime and Netflix, um, but um, uh, for and, and, and reading and reading books, but but n certainly not for writing unless you have a, a memory. Second thing I would like to um, comment is that um, um, I'm not here representing uh, my country. Um, the Spanish ambassador, my friend Ramon Gil Casar, is sitting on the first row, uh, is doing that. Uh, and I'm not representing my country because I am in my country. I'm a native-born American, apart from being a Spaniard. Um, so, um, um, and I did think that in the capital nation of, um, of um, uh, my country, um, it was very cold outside, but it usually is colder <laughs> inside than outside, uh, at least uh, um, uh, since Monday when I arrived here. Um, just to give you an idea, I went to uh, the region um, of the Sahel. I don't like the word Sahel. I don't know, Jeremiah, whether the map is. Uh, I, I have to press one of these buttons. Pick one. Yeah. Which one? Any any bu any button? Okay. Oh, there we are. Okay. So I I don't really like the um, the uh, word Sahel because Sahel is all that and all the way to Eritrea, uh, incidentally. Um, uh, but I mean, I'll just uh, leave that over there. The red, the red slice is. Yeah. What is but 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 I did travel to the, the region with um, with the Spanish foreign minister. Uh, we went to uh, Niger, we went to Burkina, we went to Mali, and we went to Mauritania uh, in in uh, in four days. Um, we spoke with, well, we spoke, he spoke actually, uh, with either the president or uh, the prime minister of uh, all those countries. And uh, we got, <coughs> um, of those four countries, and we got four different number of Tuaregs, ranging from 50,000 to 5 million, <laughs> depending on who was counting them. Four different origins to the problem four different types of problems and four different solutions to those problems in those countries. So um, the Sahel is, is, is rather complicated. No? And, and, and two weeks ago, I was in Ivory Coast. I was in Abidjan, and I was uh, moderating uh, a panel. Thank goodness I was moderating the panel, because the panel was the African Union representative, Burundian ex-president Pierre Bouyoya. Um, we had uh, Michel Dominique Reverend de Menton, who is the EU uh, representative for Sahel. We had the EU commissioner uh, for international cooperation, humanitarian aid and crisis response, Kristalina Georgieva. We had an ECOWAS commissioner, and we had a representative of Said Jinit, which is from the United Nations Office for West Africa. And each one of them had a different version to give of what was happening in the Sahel. And um, everybody, everybody who uh, is alive today has a strategy for the Sahel, everybody. There are six main strategies in that area. We've got the European Union strategy for security and development in the Sahel. It covers Mali, Mauritania, and Niger. We have the United Nations Integrated Strategy for the Sahel, published this very same year, which covers five countries. You see, the European Union only looks at three. The United Nations goes a bit further. They look at five. Uh, we have the, um, no, sorry, the United States uh, uh, integrated strategy. We have the United Nations Office for the Coordination of <coughs> Humanitarian Affairs, the Sahel Regional Strategy, also 2013. We have the African Union Strategic Concept for the Resolution of Crisis in the Sahel. We have the West Africa Regional Conference and Action Program for Stability. And we have another different thing, the European Union-led 
Global Alliance for Resilience Initiative, AGIR, in the Sahel and West Africa from last year, which is handed over to the uh, uh, Club de Sahel from the OECD based uh, in Paris. I'll come back prob prob uh, uh, to the uh, EU strategy um, if I have the time. But the fact is that what we are, uh, when we talk about the, 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 the Sahel, is one of the poorest regions in the world. And it faces uh, simultaneously the challenges of extreme poverty, the effects of climate change, frequent food crisis, rapid population growth, fragile governance, corruption, unresolved internal tensions, etc., etc. Okay. According to all the reports um, that have been published lately by think tanks and by the United Nations, neither Poverty, neither climate change, neither food crisis, neither population growth are factors of increased violence and conflict. It sounds strange, doesn't it? Well, that's the conclusion of those reports. But what they do have in the area is political instability of one sort or another. And that is a factor of conflict. The fragility of the government impacts, of course, the stability of the region and the ability to combat both poverty and security threats, which are on the rise. But the main idea that I would like to um, let you know uh, about or, or, or leave on top of the table is that the Sahel as such is not a different region from the rest, from the Sahara, and is not a different region from the southern part, uh, the one in gray, and from the Gulf of Guinea. It's all interlinked. Uh, those uh, blue lines you see there are the trafficking routes. Through Guinea-Bissau, you've got cocaine from South America. Mm. You've got heroin from Asia coming in through Nigeria and going all the way to Egypt. You've got movement of arms coming down. And in other maps, you've got human trafficking going up and down. Basically, the Sahara has never been a border, has never been an obstacle. It has been like a sea navigating, uh, where people were navigating up and down. And what we are seeing in this area is that, one, the trade uh, routes that have been used for centuries are still very much in use. Two, that water is not a factor for those trade routes, but the crossroads are. And uh, three, that the division between the Sahara, the Maghreb, and the Sahel was uh, uh, provoked by the uh, colonial powers, notably France, when, uh, when they arrived uh, in the middle of the 19th century. And you have crossroads and, 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 and cities, some of which we are now uh, reading about in the press um, uh, relatively frequently, which went from 30,000 people in the 17th, 18th, and beginning of the 19th century to 3,000 or 2,000 people in colonial time, and are now up to over 100,000 people in the same places in which the caravans were stopping, also with slave trade and human trafficking at the time, in those very same places, cities of 100, 150,000, 200,000 people are now uh, in place. Are they all Tuaregs? Depends who you listen to. Um, if the president of Niger told us there are only 50,000 Tuaregs and that the Tuaregs are a legend, they're not Tuaregs. Uh, if uh, you listen to the uh, Mauritanians, the, uh, everybody is Tuareg, including the Nigerians. Uh, if you uh, listen to the president of Mali, he was a provisional president, uh, he said that he would not dare to give a number of, of, of Tuaregs. So the Sahara is not a desert in the classical sense of the world, but an, an inhabited uh, uh, region where there is a lot of activity. 
Contrary to common belief, again, as I was saying, the oases were not built where water was found. Rather, they were located at the junctions of trade routes, and water needed to be found subsequently. In the desert, one does not live of what the desert offers you, but one lives of trade, and everything is up for sale and trade. Actually, uh, um, the two biggest uh, sources of income of the uh, local people are, one, kidnapping of uh, uh, Westerners, and let us be very clear about this, everybody pays the ransom. Every single country pays the ransom, regardless of what they say. And the second is tobacco, cigarettes, even more than cocaine and even more than human trafficking, which is at least uh, interesting to know. But if we do recognize that there is uh, an inextricable link between security and development, we have to act, we be I believe that us allies have to act in support of the Sahel state's national policies, because each of those states has a, a, a different policy. Incidentally, the security in the Gulf of Guinea, which has become the most dangerous area in the world for piracy, and where the highest insurance premiums are now uh, being charged by the insurance companies is having a terrible effect in that area because, of course, it's increasing dramatically the price of uh, goods, food, and commodities which are disembarked in Benin and in Nigeria and then have to be transported up to areas where there is practically nothing, like Niger and Mali. But, again, when we have a development strategy, we have to be extremely careful because the European Union has a lot of tradition and a lot of money to spend in that area. I think the US is rather absent in that area, incidentally, yeah, but that is a personal opinion. But the European Union is also trying to, uh, in, not impose, but convince uh, of uh, ideas which work in Europe and which make a lot of sense uh, on paper, but are, which are perhaps not as uh, uh, interesting for uh, those countries there. I'll give you one example. The European Union has told ECOWAS, uh, ECOWAS is the uh, West African um, uh, regional <coughs> organization, and they are rather active uh, and they, uh, in, in, in issues like transport. <coughs> they have said, OK, uh, we finance the roads, the Chinese build them, and then uh, the trucks are overloaded, uh, and therefore the roads last for six months or two years or whatever. And uh, so we are going to continue giving you uh, money and funding for uh, transport, <coughs> but we are going to impose a reduction of 30% in the weight of trucks. Now just everybody here would think that it's a good idea. You then preserve the routes, uh, uh, the roads, sorry, um, the infrastructure, and, uh, and uh, everything else. Well, the impact, if that goes through, is going to be terrible. For one thing, the price of the goods transported are going to go up dramatically. Second, the number of trucks is limited. They are what they are, and therefore there's going to be at least for a while, 30% <coughs> less food and commodities arriving to the populations up north. And 
the price is not only going to go up 30%, but since they have to invest in new trucks and buying other trucks, um, the increase uh, in price can range from 60 to 80%. And this is what the uh, European Union is, is, is doing. But we have humanitarian issues there. We have millions of people under food uh, insecurity. Um, the pledges are uh, for 2012 um, amounted uh, to about 70% of uh, the needs. In Casa Africa, we have uh, the World Food Program uh, with one of the six uh, logistical bases, and they're based in, 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 in our uh, building. Short-term needs, which um, other speakers are going to talk about, road infrastructure, education, health, and, and water supply, etc. Again, the security issues are also important. Um, over the past 50 years, there have been recurrent episodes of violence that have shaken the Sahara and Sahelian areas. States have competed for control over their respective boundaries, which are completely artificial. They have fought secessionist and extremist movements, and they have had to cope with the toppling of regimes. And never before, and that is a fact, has the intensity of this violence been so great. The situation today is distinctive insofar as the number of armed conflicts in Africa as a whole has actually been declining since the year 2000. But again, and this is, I think, important, there is no factual evidence that scarcity of resources or that food security issues lead to increased conflicts and violence in the region. And an OECD study also shows that migration and instability are not associated. The OECD, by the way, the, 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 the West uh, Africa Club of the OECD, has managed in this uh, seminar, which I attended in Abidjan, to sit around the same table for the first time in many years, the Sahel countries uh, and the uh, African uh, coastal countries in the Gulf of Guinea, with Morocco and with Algeria. Uh, which gave a perspective of the whole of the area and doesn't give this um, sensation that um, uh, Sahel is um, uh, a specific region. Okay, going a little bit to the uh, European Union, and I think with that I would, um, or what the European Union is doing, um, the origins of the strategy in the Sahel is the upsurge of Akim. Akim is the Al-Qaeda uh, uh, for the Maghreb against Westerners, the increase of drug trafficking towards Europe, and also the migration issue, which are very closely interlinked. The strategy of the European Union has four key themes. First, that security and development in the Sahel cannot be separated, and that helping these countries achieve security is integ integral to enabling their economies to grow and poverty to be reduced. Secondly, we work on the principle that achieving security and development in the Sahel is only possible through closer regional cooperation. This is currently weaker than it needs to be, and the EU has a potential role to play in supporting it. That is what the strategy says having listened again to the four leaders of the four different countries with four different opinions, I don't really know or see how the European Union can achieve this, but anyway. Thirdly, that all the states of the region, the region will benefit from considerable capacity building, both in areas of core government activity, including the provision of security and development cooperation. And fourthly, that the EU, therefore, has an important role to play both in encouraging economic development for the people of the Sahel and helping them achieve a more secure environment in which it can take place and in which the interests of the EU citizens are also protected. Now, this is on paper, and this is what Dan asked me to tell you. Yeah. But now I have to say what I think is going to happen. 
in the region. And with this, I am going to conclude. And uh, what is happening inside the European Union is that the French, who are willing, and they have proved it, both in Mali and now in the Central African Republic, to put boots on the ground, which is very convenient for the United States that does not want to put boots on the ground, are trying inside the European Union to be on the defense and security issues what the Germans are in economic and banking issues. Now, are they going to achieve that goal? I hope not. And I, if I have any, any say in this, which I won't, but if I have any say in this, I'll do my best to prevent that. One. Two, the issue of the Sahel, and this coming from somebody who lives at, I live one hour and 45 minutes by plane from Bamako, and three hours from Madrid, which is the capital of my country. Uh, what is happening is on issues like migration, security, uh, uh, terrorism, threat, etc., is a complete divide between the European Union, the South, Portugal, Spain, Italy, and France, extremely worried about our southern neighbors, and the North of the European Union that have absolutely no sensibility about what actually is going on there. That divide in the European Union, in my view, is one, unsurmountable, and two, is only going to get worse as time goes on. And the problem is there for <coughs> years to come. And the third thing is that once more, and now I'm putting my American hat on, is that the French, since the American Revolution, have a tendency to appear and disappear in the, uh, as, as uh, popular in the American uh, uh, public opinion. And now they are popular again, and I remind everybody that the, uh, in this country a few years ago, you couldn't buy French fries anymore uh, uh, because the name was changed after 9-11. After, uh, um, so they, they come, they, they, well, they, 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 no, yeah, they, they come, you know, from time to time. Uh, they mention Lafayette and then uh, everybody here feels that. And, and the French don't really tell you what they want or what they do or anything. And the cooperation is operational and tactical. And only that, and I believe that the United States is lacking a strategic, medium, and long-term perspective on Africa in general, and particularly in that region in, 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 in the Sahel. So if you get all this mixture and what's going to happen, and that the problem is here to stay, and is going to stay for a number of years, uh, what is, in my view, going to happen um, in the next 18 months to two years? One is that the, uh, un the piracy issue is going to grow, and therefore we are going to see a multinational uh, uh, solution like the one in the Horn of Africa and in Somalia, with different characteristics, of course. Uh, but we are going to see that trend uh, on the one side. And uh, on the other side, that militarily, um, other conflicts are going to start appearing uh, in, in, that, in that area. And we have the president of Libya. We have NATO pulling out of uh, Afghanistan. And I think that the less, or the, uh, the less bad option or the situation in which all of us could feel relatively comfortable is for NATO to sort of start looking south and into the Gulf of Guinea and into the Sahel region. And I think that that is probably what is going to happen. Now, that is very important because now 
what we see in the international community is a complete lack of leadership uh, in, uh, uh, in, in the region. The European Union is incapable of leading uh, because of the internal problems I was mentioning. The United States does not want to lead either in that region of the world. So at the end, the, uh, uh, the best uh, of the worst options is probably for NATO to uh, start um, uh, uh, looking down uh, towards Africa and the Gulf of Guinea. If that happens, the whole uh, scenario of transatlantic relations is going to change dramatically because we are going to have at least three uh, uh, parts if we can have a triangle, but we can also have a square if we include uh, Latin America. And in this sense, there is a very uh, interesting Atlantic initiative, which you, Dan, know very well uh, about, and, uh, and uh, which certain uh, uh, people, important people, are starting to talk about. Yeah. But this is basically what I wanted to say, and I, I have no idea. I, mean, I keep looking up and down. So, but thank you very much for bearing thank, with me. Thank you, Ambassador. I didn't expect a, a Spaniard with an American passport to refer, remind us about freedom fries and and also about uh, about uh, about France. But I do think that uh, th I think those are some very constructively, and I use that term constructively, provocative remarks, and also reflect a lot of experience in the region and, and very, very helpful. I, I take in particular that ac achieving security and development in the Sahel hell will only happen through regional security and that security and development can't be separated, I think are two messages that I, I hope that you all take from, from Ambassador Martinez Caro's very frank and open, as they say, in diplomatic circles remarks. I think very helpful and constructive. Thank you. I want to um, turn to hear, well, I want to hear from two folks who have uh, been in the region many times and really have a good handle on some of the development challenges, both at sort of at a, at a granular level and also at a, at a country level. Um, I want to first ask my friend Donovan Webster, who's a, a, a journalist who is occasionally a photographer, as he would describe himself, but uh, for National Geographic. Uh, but also uh, has been involved in several uh, nonprofit organizations that work with uh, on uh, water and education and health issues in the Sahel and uh, has been a recipient of a U.S. African Development Foundation grant funding. Uh, my friend uh, Lloyd Pearson, who was uh, formerly Assistant Administrator for Africa in the Bush Administration, then ran the U.S. African Development Foundation, which makes critical grants to small civil society groups in, in Africa in, in zones of, of extreme poverty, including in the Sahel. Um, directed me towards Donovan, and I know that Lloyd was correct in when he suggested Donovan as a speaker. So Donovan, I'm going to give you the floor, and if you could paint uh, some of the, get, help us get a better sense of some of the development challenges on the ground as you see them, and, and just some of your experience. You've been all over this region, and I think it's particularly helpful for folks to hear from, from an American like yourself who's been all over the region. Donovan, over to you. Oh boy. Um, okay. Um, I want to start by saying this. I, 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 how do I click with the pictures stuff? Uh, I'll do it for you. Uh, thank you, because I'm like a techno peasant. No, I'm, I'm as well. It's, this is sort of like one of those jokes, like how many people does it take to, <laughs> exactly. to click the clicker, right? This sort of but thing. what I want to say first is this. The United States is 23rd in the world in education. We are seventh in literacy. We are 170 something in infant mortality. The Sahel countries beat us everywhere. How is that possible? Okay, just ask yourself, how is that possible? We're the richest country in the world. The only things we're the best at are incarcerating people per capita and defense spending. We spend more than the next 24 countries below us in defense spending. How is that possible? Okay. I'm going to say that, um, you know, I did a movie called Running the Sahara, and in it um, I led three guys with Mohammed Iksa, the head, of the, uh, the head of the Tuareg people, across the Sahara Desert from Senegal all the way to the Red Sea. And, um, you know, <laughs> among other things, the Special Forces brought me beer upon occasion. And, um, you know, I just... <sighs> I, I sit there and look at that place, okay? They, they're competitive with us or beating us 
as the poorest countries in the world in all of the, the things I just talked about, education, infant mortality, how, 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 how do they do that? What's wrong with us? So about 2000, in about 2000, um, I've been going there since the 1990-something, and, and um, uh, the, Mohammed, my friend, and I got to talking, and we said, you know, what they need is, what the people here need is water. And you're exactly right, by the way, Santiago, in terms of it being an ocean, because uh, it's just trade routes. Uh, they need water, they need education, and and they need hospitals, or little, at least a little bit of medical care. When we were doing Running the Sahara, the most popular guy in any town we ended up in, or at any well, was the doctor who was from Stanford. And uh, because everybody knew they were going to get sick, and they wanted medicine ahead of time. OK? It's that simple. I mean, the runners hated it because they were like, we want to be the man and Matt Damon and na 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 na. But um, they, they, that's what they wanted. They knew they were going to get sick. Because what happens is, is that the animals get the water first in wells. Because the animals, and camel milk's great when it's fresh. That's all I'm going to say <laughs> after that. It's not good. The animals are, um, are what make the people stay alive. So the animals get the water first, and if there's any water left, the people get it. But there's sometimes not water left. So sanitation suffers. Everything suffers. That's, that's just how it goes. Um, and so we started building wells, and then we started building um, schools, and then we started building hospitals which Stanford University has graciously taken over the hospital part, which is good because I'm not good at that kind of stuff. And um, it's made an enormous Im impact. Um, a friend of mine, Lloyd Pearson, a friend of mine, uh, who was director of African Development Foundation, which is an arm of Congress, um, um, he's retired now. We, we're trying to start something called the Sahel Freedom Fund because I've been mostly doing it in Niger. And um, we have more than 200 wells, new wells there now that the African Development Foundation helped us with on 28 of, I believe. And, and the, the enormity of what fresh water can do to people is unbelievable. Muhammad said to me, you know, they, the people, if, they, if their animals die, they have to move to the city and then they get malaria and they die and they have no money. It's that simple. It literally is that simple. Um, so, you know, I, I really, Sophocles gave long speeches and um, his friends killed him. So I'm going to give a really short talk here. <laughs> um, but, but, I mean, it, it literally is that, it, it literally is that simple. I've been all the way across it several times. I know a lot of people there. They, they call me the white Tuareg. Um, I know how to speak the language. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing part of the world. And, and all we have to do, literally all we have to do, is give them a little bit of water, you know, provide them a, a means to water, educate them, including the women, including the girls, and give them a little bit of health care, and then light a fire under them. Because those people every morning wake up with nothing, and they make something out of it. That's what I got. Thank you. Thanks very much, Donovan. Thank you. I'm going to ask my friend Vivian Lowry Derrick uh, to go next. Vivian was the uh, assistant administrator for Africa at USAID in the Clinton administration and has had a distinguished career in international development uh, since then, working on education and civil society issues as well as with a particular focus on gender as well, among other. Uh, among, uh, but has been working on at, on Africa and African issues for a very long time. And, and I, if I can say it this way, I, I've always thought you were working on Mali before Mali was cool. So I'll, I'll, turn, the, <laughs> turn, the, I'll turn the floor over to you, Vivian. 
Thank you, Dan. And thank you for focusing on the Sahel when there's so many other places that one could be putting on um, one's energy. So I, unlike Donovan and Santiago, really prepared something, but I'm not <laughs> sure that it's absolutely appropriate um, given what we said. So what I'm going to do is just kind of um, <clears throat> compress it. So I started off by talking about the four sets of issues that we see now in the, in the Sahel. And I'm not going to repeat them because the other panelists and Jennifer have said them very succinctly, but they are security issues, governance issues, which we really didn't talk about um, a lot. I just um, want to say that we need to think about compromised institutions. Um, the development issues, and I'm going to go back and talk more about the environmental degradation and the recurring droughts and what that means. And then lastly, regional issues, um, a lack of regional coordination and trust, going back to something that, that you said, um, Santiago. Um, 1960. <laughs> <laughs> and there are multiple um, stakeholders that are trying to deal with the current situation in these four issues, that being um, governments, militaries, donors, and civil society. So what I'm going to do is make the case for civil society and the military. So I've got my two artifacts <laughs> that I'm going to talk about. And here's the, this is Corporal Amadou. Those are quite interesting conversation starters. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I think that there's some agreement on priorities and three big challenges. And um, Santiago, you may or may not uh, agree with, with these. But first of all, I think that there's agreement that security issues of dealing with AQIM and its offshoots are absolutely essential before you can begin to really um, delve into development in a, in a meaningful way. Secondly, food security um, and taming recurring drought is essential. Um, there's this saying, le ventre affamé n'a pas d'oreille, the, the hungry stomach has no ears. And so I'm going to um, go back to that. And then thirdly, um, as we start thinking about restarting or increasing sustainable development after the, um, the Mali um, crisis, when you start to think about economic growth, you can't get there without civil society. And so you I think that we can use development issues to really promote peace. This. So let me um, suggest that we can't make progress towards dealing with the challenges without the central role of um, civil society and the military. So let me start with the case for civil society. And when I'm talking about civil society, I'm talking about everything um, between the extended family that you see in many places in the Sahel and the, the state. So it's school, it's voluntary associations, it's NGOs, it's the private sector, it's political parties. And I think that this is really a potent force that can be mobilized to change policies and it can be politically organized to really change governments. You don't have to go to a coup when, if you really um, use civil society well. And civil society, when it's mobilized, can really demand peace. And the example of that is Mozambique, if we can go back to that. And it was civil society, particularly women, saying enough of this, we're not going to have it anymore, that ultimately led to um, the peace discussions in Mozambique. And so you can have effective development impact when civil society is, is mobilized. And USAID um, noted in one of its recent evaluations that, and I'm quoting, our impact <coughs> multiplied tenfold when we work in close coordination with the international community and local leadership, local leadership, civil society. So in terms of development, um, civil society, I think, is really important when you start thinking about women. Um, and those of you who know me knew that I was going to come to that point. <laughs> but um, this is a necklace that this group, Femme Afrique Solidarité, um, put out to celebrate 1325 and women. Women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, What's 1325? 1325 is the UN resolution that calls for 
um, women's involvement in um, peace building and, and um, peacemaking. And so here we've talked about five or six different things that women can do, um, contributions that they can make to de development. Um, and women, lastly, are important as development watchdogs. Now, Santiago, you talked about all the money that's going to come to um, the, to the uh, Sahel and a lot that's going to Mali as well. Well, we know that corruption is a big problem. And if we are able to have watchdogs, and women really do do this, then we're, we're going to see a better use of all that money. Because if this money is squandered, it's going to be that much more difficult to get it um, again. All right, so my second big agent for development and security is the military. And this is Corporal Amadou. Now, some of the militaries have been the um, source of much of the mischief that we've seen, particularly in Mali. But there's a potential for rank and file soldiers across the, the, the Sahel to be agents for security and development. Um, so let's consider this man, because to me, he is really key to development in the, um, in the Sahel. There are multiple factors that are impinging upon him. First of all, is he going to get paid? If he's not going to get paid, then why doesn't he turn to AQIM? Because they have lots of money because of the kidnappings that we were talking about um, earlier. He also has to, he is a soldier, so he has to consider mission, doctrine, patriotism, loyalty to his country. And it was the humiliation of the Malian forces and in their inability to um, counter the, the Tuaregs and tamed and tamed the jihadists that sparked the, um, the coup in, in Mali. So Corporal Amadou also has to have religious considerations. Is he a traditionalist? Does he approve of Sharia law for his country? Again, something that he has to think about. And is he respected? I mean, all of us want to have some element of respect. Does his government appreciate his military or is he dismissed? Has he been trained to respect civilians and to not violate women? We've all heard of all the, um, the rapes and violations that ostensibly have taken place by the Malian military. So there we have this poor man with all of these factors impinging upon him. But there's an opportunity now for him to participate in rebuilding security and to contribute to development, particularly to have a job um, in his post-military life. So in terms of security, this is now referenced specifically to Mali. The Malian military is being retrained by the French and the Germans. But beyond, the, but beyond the, I'm not going to go there, <laughs> be, beyond the traditional training, um, these troops need to have training in human rights. They also need to have training in reinforcing the doctrine of civilian control of the military. And that in that way, they can make a major contribution to security. And they can also build some cohesion within the military, because if you have training with troops from different parts of the country, then they are likely to be able to have um, a much, to be able to forge some closer feelings. But this military can also be an arm for development. Soldiers can get skills training for employment in their post-military service. And this has happened um, in, in Zambia. Militaries in, uh, soldiers in Zambia are trained to be agricultural workers, both during their service in the military and um, after. So um, I think that we need to be very careful and nurture Corporal Amadou, because he really is a key. Um, let me just add parenthetically that um, these armies can also, when they're restructuring, um, integrate women in a, in a major way. And so that Corporal Amadou can also be um, a mentor to a woman who is joining his army. So I'm going to end with an observation on agriculture and, and food security. 
Um, as I said before, you cannot achieve development or security without adequate food. Um, it's the nexus where civil society and the military can work together. So the Sahel crisis, we all know, has resulted from poor rainforest, failed harvest, rising food prices, and then it was aggravated when the migrant workers returned from Libya, and then it was further aggravated um, with the, um, the terrorism that we saw in um, northern um, Mali. So you've got this really potent recipe for misery. Um, in Mali, the, um, the drought situation has been overlaid with the, the instability resulting from the coup. The refugees are still out of the country, local and regional markets are disrupted, so food prices are higher. Um, some crops were destroyed by locusts. Um, farmers were unable to plant last year, so um, many of them incurred major debts, but also they um, sold their seeds, so that this is going to be really hard to restart um, um, the, the service, the, the farming agriculture service in, in, uh, in Mali. But again, civil society can help. Women's groups um, can um, be formed into brigades to plant, um, to fertilize, to learn about the environment. And here is where I think that USAID um, can be helpful because USAID has this um, program focusing on resilience, which is marrying humanitarian assistance with development. And so as USAID is moving forward on this, if they focus on civil society, if they focus on women, then I think that we could see some positive movement. Military training also can um, incorporate the environment and agricultural components. And for those of you who um, work with militaries, please encourage them to focus on incorporating the environment and, and agriculture um, components into their, their training. You know, there's this, this feeling among so many um, so many citizens in so many countries that there's something that's um, second class about agriculture and that one shouldn't be dirtying one's hands to be involved in agriculture. But agriculture and food security is essential. So if militaries, if civil society can rethink their views of agriculture, then we can, I think, can see something um, positive um, coming out. So I don't want to end on uh, uh, a negative note. I want to close on an optimistic note. So if development programs are encouraged to target civil society, we may see more rapid progress. If we promote civil society and its community organizing power, then we're likely to see um, better outcomes. And we need to harness the power of militaries for development. And so. The situation in the Sahel can change. There's adequate funding, because the EU has pledged this five, um, five billion euros. Um, five billion euros. This is, is a lot of, of, of money. So if we have um, coordination among the, the donors, consultation and project implementation with civil society and local partners, and reorientation of the militaries, we can see some um, real progress. And we might be able to bridge some of the religious and ideological di divides and give sustainable development a chance. So I thank you. Thank you very much, Vivian. Thank you. That was really very, very helpful. Um, let me ask uh, my friend, Ambassador Bill Garvelink, if he could, if he could res uh, wrap, wrap this up in this conversation up. I think there's a... <laughs> My sense is you know, maybe hard to do, but I think there, we've talked about a number of security challenges. We've talked about a number of development challenges. You've been in the region many times, uh, and so I think you know we were having an interesting conversation before this event um, about about the development challenges and talk a little bit about those development challenges, given the context that that we've just that you've just heard. 
but also talk a little bit about where where is the, where's the United States, what what the U.S. should could be doing or should be doing, because I, I get the sense that, I mean, if I look at, okay, Mauritania, Mali, Niger, Chad, we have an aid mission in Mali. Uh, we don't have one in, in the rest of those countries. Uh, we have very limited uh, instruments in terms of what we can currently do now. So I, I think there's, you know, there's, there's some things we are doing. Certainly, uh, we're doing a lot in Mali, but I get the sense we could be doing more that we may need to think about doing additional things in the region. So over to you, Bill. Thanks. <laughs> it, it's always interesting being the last speaker. I've been, I've been crossing out things that I don't have to say, and I'm, I'm really left with very little here. Um, <laughs> so I'll make a couple of little observations. If I can go, go, go through your notes. <laughs> go deep. <laughs> That could come in here. Got some leftover. Yes. <laughs> I would like to just make a couple of observations about what everybody said in general about the Sahel and sort of repeating what, what folks said. And then talk a little bit about emergency response to the droughts, the recurring droughts. And then a little bit about uh, what, what's going on for the U.S. government uh, in, in development in the Sahel. I get, now that I don't work for the U.S. government anymore, I can say what I think, and what, <laughs> what's working and what's not. Um, you know, first of all, as people have said, the Sahel is, is a very inhospitable place. It's suffering from deforestation and all these sorts of things that are going on. Uh, and it's a very fragile environment, and it's getting more fragile. And realistically, uh, the Sahel over the past 20, 30, 40 years has been a development backwater. Nobody pays attention to the Sahel, Sahel unless there's a drought or maybe now with, with terrorist activities, but it's generally been forgotten by most development agencies. And as Dan said, the, the uh, U.S. government, I'll have more to say about this in a few minutes, but the U.S. government has closed down most of its missions there. It, it used to have missions in virtually every country. Now, now <coughs> virtually nothing. Uh, so, and that's true of most donor agencies. There's a drought, we worry about Sahel for a year, then we forget about it, and then a drought happens again. So uh, this is sort of the, the characteristics. There are marginal pop, uh, populations, and they're mostly nomadic ones, the Tuaregs. And they've got a lot of very long-standing grievances that have not been addressed. The institutions are weak. Uh, governance isn't so hot. There's a lot of corruptions. We've talked about that. And so there's all kinds of problems uh, that have been in the Sahel for a long time. Now we have some additional things. Libya, we have more weapons, skilled soldiers, and one people don't talk about too often, uh, the one mediator in the Sahel region, Gaddafi, is gone. I mean, he had his good points, and this was one of them, and he's not a leavening force out there anymore. Now you have Mali and some of the traditional long-standing grievances coming to the fore with traditional groups as well as the, the, uh, the terrorist organizations that are more active there, generating lots of IDPs, displaced persons, and instability, which affects everybody uh, in doing development uh, you know, in the country. But when you look at it, when you look at all these things, nothing has really created too many additional problems in the Sahel. Maybe the terrorist groups a bit, but the instability, the insecurity in certain regions, the problems, the poor governance, it's all been there for 30 or 40 years. It's just getting a little bit more complicated now. Um, and it's getting a little bit more attention. But there hasn't, this has been going on in the Sahel for a very, very long time. And one of the things I just want to make a few comments about is droughts. There, are, there used to be droughts that sometimes led to famines every decade or so. Now it's every two or three years. Uh, it happens again and again and again. And from my perspective, and I disagree a little bit with you, Vivian, I, uh, we're not handling it uh, as an international community in a very effective way. What the studies have shown from the 70s and 80s and 2005, and I know Mike, my boss, former boss here, can comment on 2005 because he spent a lot of time out there, and uh, 2010 and 11. Uh, the lack of calories is not a reason for the high malnutrition rates and the high death rates for girls, women, uh, and children under five. That is not a factor. In fact, in the northern areas of Kenya, or sorry, of Niger, Mali, and other areas, in the nomadic areas, malnutrition rates are lower than in Bamako, in the wealthier sectors of society where markets are working and food is available. What the problem is, is bad health care, bad water, no sanitation, malaria, 
uh, very weird, that's a poor choice of words, unfortunate weaning techniques for children. After two weeks after birth, you're drinking uh, polluted water and mixtures of things. These are where the international community, these are the things the international community has to focus on. It doesn't make any difference how much food you ship into the Sahelian region. It's not going to make any difference, and it has not made any difference uh, as you go through these droughts. And again, I think the World Food Program is just issued an appeal for, uh, you know, a, a billion dollars for food. For marginal populations or vulnerable populations in some isolated groups, perhaps that makes sense. But in general, food is not a requirement in the Sahel. It's a longer term, it's a development problem, not a food shortage problem. And we have to take that seriously, and that has very long or broad implications for what we do. That's a long-term project. That's not something where you ship in 100,000 tons of food and you're done and you forget about the Sahel uh, and, and get on with the next thing. It doesn't work like that. It's got to be a long-term program to change weaning patterns, to provide decent health care, to make sure there's proper sanitation. Hygiene is a very important, you know, in the business it's the wash stuff that's really important. Uh, for these populations. That's where the international community should put its focus and deal with the root causes of these recurring droughts. Otherwise, it's just going to continue and it's going to fester with all these other kinds of problems and just be a recurring problem that costs the international community a, a pretty penny. This, this is expensive stuff. That is a, a necessary thing to do. If you look at this, I'm looking now at the United States from the emergency response in 2012, we're starting to see some changes. Instead of just pumping in food, uh, the Food for Peace Office did some long-term funding for sanitation. They did some cash programs as well as, as food programs. Uh, it's the Bureau for Food Security uh, started providing some money into the Sahel for the first time, which is different from what they do in their food security activities. There have been much more attention to water, sanitation, family planning, and these sort of things. So the emergency response in 2000, 2012, certainly of, of USAID and Food for Peace and these organizations, it was different and better. Much more nuanced and much more thoughtful. Now on top of that, you have the aid in general. There are programs that are focusing more on land tenure, economic opportunities, jobs for young men, which is really important in the Sahel, governance issues as well as women, and then the food, health, water, and sanitation issues. So they're layering on top of each other. And they're starting to work good. That's the resilience you mentioned. Mm -hmm. We're first time in a disaster response. We're starting to see the, the emergency activities with the long-term development activities. And that's great. Now, as Dan mentioned, there's a, there's a slight problem with the commitment of the U.S. government. We have one aid mission <laughs> uh, in Mali. And in most of the other embassies, we have a food for peace person, but that's it. And then a regional office in Senegal. So it seems to me if we're going to mount a serious development effort in the Sahel, we have to look at our staffing. Now, as we were talking about, we got booted out of half the places in, Af or in Latin America. Maybe we could open a few missions in, uh, in Africa and in the Sahel. Uh, one, yeah. one for one, one for Bolivia, one for Ecuador. One and, for Russia. There you go. <laughs> and, uh, and maybe we could uh, just move people around a little bit, uh, just like we closed them 20 years ago or whenever we did. But there are things that can be done, and there's, there's in fact, um, I think there's some good signs about we're finally looking at the drought situation in the Sahel a little bit different. It's not just a food issue. And you've got a link development. And just as an observation from where I sit, it may make sense and it may, be, may have been an important thing maybe to have the French uh, and the African force intervene in the Sahel. And training of the military is a great thing. Uh, diplomatic initiatives are underway, but none of these, in my sense, will will deal with the root causes of the Sahel unless there is a very robust development program that goes <coughs> along with this. And I guess, and to your comment, I can see the U.S. is a bit active on the military side, training with their trans, uh, it, well, yeah, they have their um, trans-Sahara uh, partnership program. And they're starting to do things in the uh, development area where I don't see the U.S. presence unless I'm missing it. It's in the diplomatic side here. Uh, I think the, the, inter the multilateral agencies and some of the European governments have special envoys and a big focus. I, to my sense, we're pretty quiet. I guess maybe we're tied up in the Middle East. I'm not, not sure what we're, what we're doing, but I think we're a little 
uh, missing when it comes to the diplomatic side. If we're thinking of military, diplomatic, and development, the, the one that's not there is the diplomatic side. But those are just a few observations, and uh, with that, I'll quit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Thank yeah, Jonathan, please. Um, it's really funny. That was perfect, Bill. Um, uh, really, the last time I was in Chad, I couldn't believe it. I'm in the Capitol, and I get dragged in to the U.S. Embassy. Sorry, there. trivia question. What is the capital of Chad? <laughs> <laughs> and they say to me, you're going up to the Tobesti? And I said, yeah, which is way up in the north. It's way the heck up there. It's right next to Libya, which is a real fun capital. And, um, and they were like, well, when you come back, tell us what you learned. They didn't even go there. I mean, it, it gets to your point exactly, Bill. You know, they, 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 they're not interested in reaching out. It drives me crazy. That's all. Well, I have to, I have to respond to that in just a minute, because I, uh, I guess, having been an ambassador, I would disagree with that. <laughs> um, I think the dilemma is, and we've seen it in Benghazi and other places, you have to be very careful where you go uh, if, if you're an official American. And it's tricky business. And if you're an ambassador, that's your number one security for your embassy admission is to protect your people. And so you have, have all kinds of different security folks looking at these itch, the situations. And I would be loath to send my folks into a difficult area uh, if there was any suspicion of kidnapping and that sort of thing. You have to be very, very careful. And, that's, and I would bet that's one of the reasons we only have a mission in Mali. So you so send just, a so probe. So just tell me, Bill, tell, I, think, I think, thank you for putting your finger on that, and thanks for your response, because I, I think this is I one of the dilemmas, so, yeah. which is, uh -huh. I think one of, the, one of the dilemmas, which is, okay, this is a very dangerous area. I think we've, we've talked about this in terms of kidnappings. I think Santiago referenced the, the dangers. I think, I think Vivian talked about sort of the role of the militaries, both in terms of sort of there's sort of a, and, and frankly, and, and terrorists and, and bad guys that people, a lot of people with guns running around in this region. Yeah, lots of guns. Um, and so, how do you, how do we, how do we be effective developmentally in such a tough environment? Let me, let me put that to you first, and then maybe each of the panels might. Not. Let's just, given that this is so tough an environment, Great. and given this is such a governless space, how does the U.S. play? Or how does the U.S. be developmentally effective here? How can other donors be effective here, and how do we, how do we, how do we negotiate that issue? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's no. why we have think tanks, right? I mean, yeah, right, that's right. right. You're supposed to write right, something. Exactly. Okay, I'll go, I'll give me give me two weeks, and I'll come back on come down from the mountaintop and, and come up with an answer. But but in the meantime, what what's your take on a, that? It, those are that's a tough issue, and you have to go very carefully and move very slowly and work with all the, the tools that you have in an embassy in a U.S. government. And that's why the mixture with the military, uh, with, with the uh, African force that's there, and to find out just where you can go and probe and, and do what you can do. One thing I would consider, which I think probably would be heresy for a lot of folks, but it, it might be interesting in a place like this, is in Afghanistan we had uh, provincial reconstruction teams that were a mixture of security folks and development people and State Department people. Uh, it has, that like technique it. has had mixed results, but I think in general has done some good things. And I don't think it's quite the nasty environment that Afghanistan and Iraq were when those things were started. And that may be a way to, to begin to move out into areas where you couldn't otherwise, otherwise operate. And it's a starting point. And then hopefully it can grow and security will improve. But that's a way to, as you say, probe out there and take a look uh, with, with a different mixture of, uh, of people. So okay, so I'm, I want the audience to take away a couple of things. One is we've had we've had been forced to close aid missions in three or four countries in the last 12 months: Russia, Ecuador, Bolivia. We have a cap on the number of aid missions that we can have around the world, and it's a negotiation with the Congress. It's a negotiation with the State Department. Seems to me, I think, as Bill was saying, you could you could open some. But I also think this issue of PRTs and there's I think that's a very interesting twist. 
uh, given the challenges I think that Donovan was outlining and sort of Bill was, was responding to in terms of saying, this is a very dangerous environment. It's complicated. So we talk in, in think tank terms about this is a governless space and it means there's a lot of bad guys with guns r driving around in pickup trucks, you know, waiting to kidnap people and kill people. So it's darn dangerous, but we, you know, we, at the same time, we've got a lot of interests at play here. And so something like a PRT approach might, might be a way to respond. I'm going to ask Santiago to, re to respond, to that, but then I'm going to like the other two panelists to, to reflect on that as well. Santiago? Yeah, well, um, <laughs> me having been an ambassador, um, um, I, have, I have had actually um, two experiences, too, in my life with um, a U.S. ambassador's armored vehicle. One was when Ambassador Dell's armored BMW um, broke down in the driveway to my house mm. <laughs> on a Friday evening, and it was there until Monday morning. We couldn't leave the house mm. until Monday morning because nobody um, could move that thing uh, yeah. off the driveway. <laughs> the second one was when I was sitting inside um, another armored vehicle, um, um, which came, was bought after that incident by the <laughs> American the taxpayer uh, with Ambassador McGee uh, and the ambassador of the uh, United Kingdom in Zimbabwe. And we were okay. certain, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. Jim McGee, and, 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 and um, um, we, had, uh, we were surrounded by the um, uh, Zimbabwean police um, who um, um, decided that they were uh, going to um, actually burn the car with us inside. <laughs> and uh, I simply got out of the car, and, and they didn't shoot me, and I said, well, I, I'm, I'm, I really have to go. <laughs> And they said, well, no, get back in the car. And I said, no, after what you've told us, I really have to go. Wow. And, and so anyway, but um, I, I, I don't think that, that um, I'm, I think that people do get on the terrain. People do know. Um, it seems to me, it, it honestly seems to me that the um, United States um, could be a little bit more active in Africa both on the development field, but of course that is, that is, there are financial considerations and, and, and those also have to be taken into account. Um, and politically, I, I actually miss um, on the, um, the US in Africa, um, if, I may, uh, if I may just put that on the table. I miss the political, uh, uh, The political weight that the United States can uh, can and can put forward. Um, you yeah. were ambassador to the DRC, uh, and, and therefore the Great Lakes region, right. um, <laughs> which is still an ongoing problem. Mm -hmm. And in 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 my view, either the U.S. Um, uh, steps in again, because it was done by Clinton, mm -hmm. uh, uh, steps in again or that area is, is, is still going to be a source of conflict in Africa. Yeah. Having said this, there is one thing I would like to point out. Uh, Africa is going a lot better than it was years ago. Seven out of 10 of, uh, 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 of the highest growing uh, uh, country or the fastest uh, growing countries uh, economically in the world are, uh, in the last decade, are in Africa. Yep. Uh, Lagos, for example, and we're talking about the basically the area, Lagos <coughs> has a higher consumer base than Mumbai in India. Mm. Ni yes. That's yeah, true. Nigeria, Nigeria has a higher consumer base uh, uh, than uh, both India and Russia in, 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 many, uh, in many ways. The problem is a problem of distribution of, of, of that wealth and of that growth. Uh, but you, you were talking, and I think that, that we do have to talk about women. 
And the Sahel, of course, goes into Senegal. And there are, the, the way women manage new technologies, the way women uh, who happen to be, in my humble opinion, and I said that before, and you said yay, please say yay again. <laughs> uh, uh, women, in my humble opinion, happen to be the backbone of the African continent. Uh, uh, and, 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 and the way that they are using and doing more things, I think, are, are very important. But unless uh, we really get our act together on, on what you mentioned uh, also, governance, for example, yeah. and, 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 uh, and those type of things. Um, uh, we, uh, Africa is, is going forward, but it could leap forward. Um, and that is uh, something that we have to um, balance development aid, sure, Dan, development aid, development presence, but also political clout, political weight, and political pressure on issues like governance, on issues like regional cooperation, and, and things like that. Vivian, I'm just thinking about when you were assistant administrator, you had to work in a lot of complicated places. How do you balance this issue of security while also working in, in some, you know, having to do, to do certain sorts of development work in some tough places. How do you bounce that? Bill, Bill put on the table this issue of, you know, think, think about maybe it's a PRT bridge. Is it maybe working through local civil society groups? How should we be, how should we be thinking about this, especially in the context of the Sahel? Mm -hmm. um, you, you put your, your finger on it. Um, I think that what distinguishes USAID is the ability to work closely with local counterparts. Um, after the embassy bombings um, and the decision to consolidate um, all US presence in the embassy, there was strong resistance to that from um, people at USAID because everyone felt that what distinguished us, what made us able to do effective development work was the ability to go Get out. and, and establish relations with local counterparts and keep them and be able to, to, to see them. Clearly, um, security, U.S. security interests, as you, as you said, Bill, um, um, won the, the day. But this idea of building civil society, local ownership, that's just absolutely key. And the other key to, to me um, is education, investment, long-term involvement, investment in, in education. Because you're not only teaching skills that are going to help in terms of economic development, you're also teaching values. And so that combination to me is, is um, really, really you know, important. And also that USAID, um, through the organizations that it contracts with, um, NGOs can build these relationships that last for literally decades. Uh, I was president of the African American Institute. We had a program, AFGRAD, an atlas that brought people, um, Africans, for PhDs here in the United States. These people then became ministers, um, and you could have a, a conversation and a dialogue that you could just peel away layers of, um, of both national interest and um, the whole trust and distrust issue. So to me, the investment in civil society, education, long-term is, is what distinguishes us and what long-term is going to help the United States regain the, the intellectual <coughs> capital and heft that you were talking about. Let me, you have been all a uh, very patient audience. I know there are a lot of knowledgeable folks in the room. I'd like to take a couple of comments or questions from the audience and well. we can take a, take a few. This gentleman here, my friend Bob Berg, uh, this woman behind Bob, those three. But let's start with this gentleman here. Like just hit microphone. Thank you. I'd just like to follow up we'll the panel a little bit briefly on um, the issue of security writ large. There's a, the spotlight is quite bright on uh, U.S. official presence. And you just identify yourself. And what I'm sorry, I'm Murphy from Chemonics International. Yeah. Um, but with implementing partners and organizations doing the actual work on the ground at behest of donors, there isn't much of a a conversation existing around securing access for those implementing partners, as Donovan was saying, who actually have to go to these locations in these dangerous environments with uh, very little funding and very little ability to 
have a, a larger spotlight put on the actual field presence of workers, be they local national staff or be they home office staff or international staff in the field. And I would just like to hear some comments on, on that whole aspect of security for implementing partners. So let's, let's bunch these comments together. I'd like to hear also from my friend Bob Berg. Can I just address that real no, quick? No, Donovan, we're going we're gonna, to we're okay. bunch several of them together. Please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, Bob Burke, former senior advisor of ECA. I, I didn't hear some issues that I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about. Uh, catering development and security to nomadic peoples is a, is a difficulty. Um, when I chaired the DAC group on evaluation, the lowest scores were dealing with by donors with uh, nomadic people because it ca called for a level of cultural social knowledge that donors just didn't have. So it's not just a question of do you have staff in the capital city, but w who's on that staff? What are the skills that are on that? Uh, population growth and population planning is a tremendous issue. And communications, I wanted to just mention that I think the breakthroughs going on now in communications and AID and State Department are doing some things now um, in Chad, in Niger, in northern Nigeria that make me feel that distance education, finding ways to link in with nomadic peoples through IT and through, through um, uh, uh, distance education radio uh, uh, is, I think, going to offer enormous help. When we kept pestering the State Department saying, what kind of communication strategy do you have to, to make the people in northern Mali feel that they are part of a nation and that, they, that they're, they're integral to the nation's survival? And even to this day, it's, well, we're still working on that strategy. I mean, it's, it's pathetic. So particularly when you have next door success stories going on in Niger and Chad on, on, on distance education and, and on communications. So those are issues that I just wanted to flag. Hi, Rachel Yavinsky from Population Reference Bureau. There have been a few mentions of population growth, including the comment just before me, and more discussion on the role of women, but I wanted um, to see if you had any more comments or thoughts on the contribution of gender roles to the challenges in the Sahel, but also the contribution of women's empowerment, reproductive health and family planning to resilience and to improving the conditions there. <laughs> Okay, Catherine Marshall from Georgetown University. Uh, first, on the on the population dynamics, just the the fact that this is one of the highest population growth rates in the world, and uh, I think strategically, uh, that issue of the increasing population land pressure is must be considered a huge element in the fragility. Uh, but very little was said here about the religious dynamics. Uh, and obviously part of the religious dynamics would be within the sort of uh, terrorism and security, but you hear people talking a lot about the changing nature of religion and different influences coming in from the Gulf, uh, uh, the threat to the traditional Sufi, uh, the sort of balance with um, uh, with the more traditional uh, religion. How much do we know about that? Who knows about it? Uh, what do we do about it? Okay, a lot of very thoughtful, interesting questions. Sorry, we got four, so we, we but, uh, uh, but I think, why don't I ask, I'm gonna ask Bill uh, Garvelink, I'm gonna ask you to start first uh, and take any, any and all, or any or all, and just, you can just go through and we'll make sure we cover each of the questions from various perspectives. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I'll just make three Push parts. Push the button. Uh, yeah, that one. Have to? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> first required. of all, security for uh, civil society organizations, NGOs, and that sort of thing working in difficult areas. Hopefully, uh, when you're doing that, the aid mission and embassy 
is in uh, close discussion with you guys about what's going on and their perspectives. And, and when I was working for AID in those kind of environments, there was usually funding available to, to hire uh, security. Now, be careful who you hire. <laughs> uh, but, but uh, I would. There, there's usually provision for for you know meeting your security needs as well. And if not, there should be, and that should be brought up with with the aid mission or with the bureau, or with the embassy where you're working. So that I mean, that would be my, my comment on that. Just Bob, just your uh, dealing with nomadic populations. I should have mentioned one thing, and that in my certainly my conversations a few days ago with Earl Gast. He mentions media as a very big thing in the Sahel, and particularly with nomadic populations. And the communication gap has been a big factor contributing to the rising tensions and grievances. So you're uh, absolutely right. It's a, it's a tough, tough group of people to deal with. And I think a, a, a real secret to this is, is uh, using media in much more effective ways. We've got new tools now. That makes it easier, too. So that should be a centerpiece. And it is one of the four priorities uh, of, of Earl Gast, who's the head of the Africa Bureau at AID. Uh, and so I should have mentioned that. So I'm glad you brought it up. And then the role of women and reproductive health and all of that, you can't underestimate how important this is. Uh, in all the difficulties that are out there uh, in the Sahel, so I, you know, I don't have a whole lot of information on this other than say you're absolutely right, and those are <laughs> it's uh, it's got to be a priority for any effective program. Okay, Santiago, let me ask you to. I'd love for you to take on the issue of the the, re, the population issues, or also this issue in particular, the religion aspect. I'd be pretty curious what your take is on on that specific issue. Thank you, Dan. I, I, I'm just going to make a brief mention. Um, in in some of those countries, um, particularly in Mauritania, uh, now, yeah. and uh, in 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 some other regions. Um, the fact that you are a Western uh, Christian, uh, which is the majority in the West, not necessarily um, a given, but um, it is, makes you automatically a target. Mm. Uh, and what the way we do it is that normally uh, our NGOs work with locals. Um, Meaning the Sp Spanish, Spanish, European or Spanish? Uh, yeah, Spanish. Uh, uh, Spanish NGOs and Spanish Development Corporation and Aid works with locals and employs locals to sort of go out on, uh, in the field. And, and, and over the years, lots of people have been trained and, 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 and the response has been uh, very positive. On the uh, communication uh, uh, for nomadic people, um, I, I've actually just noticed that we are on the map there. Those are the Canary Islands, What's <laughs> uh, <laughs> there near the Western Sahara. What's the big arrow going? No. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, there is a, a very interesting uh, um, uh, uh, originally Catholic uh, uh, radio uh, now working in, in that area on distance education, and the results are uh, exponential. Exponential. Uh, any any uh, uh, dollar you put into that, it, it, I mean, it it it, it pays. Uh, back uh, in, 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 in it's, it's very cheap way of uh, uh, furthering education. Uh, religious dynamics, I, I agree, um, that is uh, an incredible problem. Um, the uh, influence of the Wahhabis uh, coming from the Gulf in all that area is, uh, is uh, uh, very uh, 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 intense and is um, actually very harmful. Um, there are, to my knowledge, uh, three very serious uh, observatories uh, of radical uh, Islam in the area. Two of them are in Senegal and one of them is in, in, in Mali. And they're all run by Muslims. They're all run by Muslims who are very very worried about uh, the increase in radical influence um, coming from from uh, from uh, the Gulf uh, area, and they come directly. I mean, it comes directly; it gets all the way to the coast. Um, the way uh, to combat that, I don't know. Um, uh, from a purely religious point of view, um, what? 
there were in that area were a number of Christian missionaries, which no uh, and missions, which are no longer manned, because uh, we have had uh, an, an, a substantial number of them were Spanish, but uh, at least the Europeans, we have had to concentrate them in 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 in, uh, in the areas. And coming back to the point you were mentioning, when I was in the last time in Bamako, we stayed at the same hotel where the French and the Spanish and the uh, and the uh, Belgian special forces were staying. And there was a yeah. big, huge panel at, at the, uh, because it was, you know, for security reasons. Uh, and for security reasons, you know, they had these towers built with oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and whatever. And for security reasons, there was no water in the swimming pool. Beats me. Uh, 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 but, <laughs> it makes but, it tough no, to swim. No, 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 but it was there, and there was this, this, <laughs> this, and there was this, this sort of huge panel on 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 on, on uh, the entrance of the hotel, and it said, "Jogging tomorrow morning at 6 a.m." Mm. And uh, a couple of my colleagues Did and myself. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I said, yeah, how long can we uh, last uh, uh, jogging with special forces guys? <laughs> so we decided we were going to go out for a drink at night anyway. <laughs> so we were in this huge hotel uh, for security reasons. And when the bosses went to bed, we went uh, and had a couple of drinks uh, uh, in, in, in town. And they are fantastic cities uh, full of fantastic yeah. people. Uh, and and uh, it's it's probably more dangerous to be excessively concerned with security in most cases because yes, they true. then see who you are and it's a, probably the best thing to do is what we did we just walked out of the hotel nobody asked us anything and off we went so let me ask Vivian I, I want you to if you could talk about a couple different things. One is this issue of gender. You, you, you've touched on the issue of gender in your remarks and, and, and some of the comments come back to it. Could you just, let's just probe a little bit further on this issue of gender on the one hand and then could you also talk, touch on, on Bob's comment about cultural expertise because I think, is, I think what, part of what Bob is getting at is these are really complicated cultural contexts. You know, you have, you have sub-Saharan Africans, if I can call it, say that in Mali, as well as Tuareg nomadic people in the north, um, very complicated tribal situations. I mean, these lines have basically been arbitrarily drawn. So talk a little bit about this issue of this cultural expertise. And then to the extent you're familiar with, with um, Catherine's point about sort of the shifting or shift, you know, shifting dynamics within Islam in the region, to the extent you have any familiarity with that. That would be great. All in, all in three minutes or less. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so in, in terms... Just push the... I'm sorry, push the button. All right, in, in, in terms of, of gender, I truly believe that women are the key to resolving some of these, these, um, these conflicts. Particularly, uh, oh, let me give you an example. And, and it goes to, your, uh, to the question about reproduction and empowerment. When, um, and women's empowerment. Um, in the Tunisian um, um, revolution, um, a group of us went, uh, this group, FAS, um, had a, a meeting at the, um, at the AU summit. And one of the members is a Tunisian woman. Um, there was quite a bit of concern about her because she'd been close to Bin Ali, but she had worked on, <laughs> on reproductive health and rights. And she had, that was her entire life. She didn't have anything to do with Bin Ali beyond that. This was what she was focused on. What she talked about was um, the caravans that went throughout the country. And so what we thought, this group of us and that, um, at this meeting at, at the AU was why not use this idea of caravans in other countries? So if you could do something like that in Sahelian countries, then you do two things. One, you deliver information. And two, you begin to have linkages between women of different countries. So that would be m my um, take on 
how one can um, build these kinds of relationships. Find the substantive issue, i.e. reproduction, reproductive health, and the health issues that surround it, and then across countries be able to do, to um, have that commonality. That's also true for cultural experiences. You know, there's so many African organizations, professional organizations, that, um, that meet, and that's another way that you build your um, d relationships between and across cultures. In terms of women and culture, it's terribly um, difficult because of the relationships in so many countries, the, the relationship uh, with, with men. And we, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because you tell me to be quick. I do want to say what, one thing about um, the religious um, dynamic. That's Catherine's question. What this reminds me of is um, this brings in the whole question of Boku Haram, which we have not mentioned, no. which is now a part of anybody's <coughs> definition of the Sahel because of what is going um, on there. And just mention um, some of the efforts that have gone on in Kano um, <coughs> between the imam and the pastor. This is a, a well-known effort to bring <coughs> these two groups um, together. And I think that there needs to be, between various Muslim um, ideologies, this same kind of intra-faith dialogue, just like what's going on interfaith between the imam and the, the pastor, and that that might be um, a, a way forward. That would require, though, um, leaders senior <laughs> leaders to really be able to um, come together for, um, for a dialogue. Great. Thank you very much, Vivian. Um, I'm going to give my friend Donovan a, a chance to, to just comment on some of these. I'm particularly interested in your thoughts about communication issues sort of in the region in terms of some of this distance learning issues that came up. and. You work in media and also being, yeah, well, we, and, the, and then also I'm hoping you can talk about this issue of sort of the shifting religious dynamics. I suspect you have a, a pretty good sense at a granular level of what's going on there. A little bit. Um, well, first off, one of the things we're doing, I'm doing with James Noctway, who's a photographer. You may know Jim Noctway. I don't know. We're doing a thing called Africa Calling, which is where we're, we're working with MIT Media Lab, and we're getting kids cheap computers there, and then they're making music videos. That we're, and we're using African musicians to make them. It's pretty cool. So, I mean, basically what you talked about, Vivian, uh, you know, getting people just to communicate on a wider level will be an enormous thing. And with regard to security, i got to say, never carried a gun there. have had a lot of guns leveled at me, but if you make a joke, the guns go away. The Tuaregs all have, the, the Tuaregs are all packing all the time. I mean, we're out in the middle of the Sahara, and suddenly there's two lights off in the distance, and all the Tuaregs walk to their cars and feel under the front bumper for the gun. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, and yet, never a problem. I once way, I'm going to show you where it is. Way up here. I got stopped um, with Muhammad. And, and they made us sit in the car all day with the windows up, hmm. which was really hot. And yet, they let us go. They just said, okay. It was no big deal. Uh, I, so basically, in Africa, if you're not threatening and you make a joke, they're fine. With regard to nomads, I must say that um, that's the way that country, those countries have lived for thousands of years. And the problem is, is that if they lose their animals, if there's a drought, they can't live like they used to. And consequently have to move to places like al or Niamey or whatever, and, um, and Bamako. And, and, and they, don't, they don't have, they're, they're not equipped in terms of skills to live in a place like that. So it's just a cultural train wreck. I mean, and they all get malaria, and they all live in hovels, and 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 then and then the last thing is with regard. Well, um, religion. The Salafists. I don't know how to fix it. I don't, there's there's just no way to fix it. They're coming. They're coming. 
and and there's just no way around it. When we did running the Sahara, for instance, I basically just finally said, okay, I'm going to do the worst possible thing just so we can get through the Kidal region of Mali. And I hired both the civic leaders and the rebel leaders <laughs> to be our guides. <laughs> together. Yeah, and they were together. They were fine. And it, actually, they were kind of funny. Um, but, um, and they knew each other. And I just hired everybody and, and said, you know, okay, it's two weeks. You know, Matt Damon will pay for it. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I don't know how to fix that. The Salafism is going to be a huge problem. Even Mohammed Iqsa, okay, head of the Tuaregs, prays five times a day. I love him to death. He respects me, you know. But even, he's like, he's, we had this conversation actually, um, I guess six months ago. He said to me, I got two problems. I got the Salafists in the north, and my children like Britney Spears and I pray five times a day. I mean, he's like totally being ripped apart. Totally. And I feel bad for him. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do about it. Donovan, thank you. And can I do one more thing? Yes. Women. Um, I think you are exactly right. I really do. I think somehow if we could get some sort of group of women together across countries and, you know, some sort of Congress, I think it would be enormous. So that's what I got. Thank you. Santiago, I'm going to give you the last word since you traveled the longest to be here. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was, I was going to touch on what I think is uh, – I'm going to make four points The very – Briefly, the, the, the longest one is going to be the first one, is the displaced people. Yeah. That is the biggest drama of the current crisis in the Sahel. And you are very right, Donovan, very right, when you say that, that it is uh, the, the, the worst problem to solve, and it's going to be the one that's going to take the most time, and it's going to be the most expensive, mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to be the most uh, 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 resource uh, 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 intensive. Why? Because these people who had to move because of the invasion, which we can debate on that, because of, because of the invasion of northern Mali, they lost their livelihood. They lost their their uh, 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 way uh, of of living, and 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 those uh, um, uh, subsistence agriculture and 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 animals and whatever um, and to get them back to be able to feed themselves and to get back into their life that is going to take years. And three things uh, which I would like to um, uh, say: one. Um, is that a reform of the security strategy is needed because of all you've mentioned, the Salafists and, and, and what not. Second, that we have to take into account that carrying out development assistance projects has become increasingly dangerous, the abductions of aid workers and their value in dollars, and we have to know that it's going to cost us a lot more money and resources and we need to be prepared to pay for that. And the third is that regardless of, of what we might think and regardless of what Europeans think and regardless of what you can see on CNN from time to time and Fox News, some of you watch Fox <laughs> News, the majority of the migrations in that area are internal and not to Europe. And I think that that is something that we all assume that they all want to get out and go to Europe. And that is not true. The majority of migrations are internal. With Thank that, you. we're going to close the panel. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.